Good morning. morning. Let's all stand to our feet as we begin to play our offertory hymn. Let's take just a minute and greet those around you. Let them know you're glad to see them this morning. Let's sing our offertory hymn, Blessed Be the Name. This will be our offertory hymn. Blessed be the name. 
sweet mercy that I need. But the one for which I long, it makes all the others strong. I need a wall of prayer surrounding me. Sweet Amen. That wall of prayer you get down on. Thank you, Chassis. Thank you very much. Thank the Lord. Amen. Once again, it's good to see y'all. I got a card of thanks I want to read to you and share uh, with the church to the church family at New Horizons Baptist Worship Center. Thank you for allowing my wife and I to worship with you during revival. You made us feel welcome and loved. Thank you also for the gracious gift. It is greatly appreciated it will be used to continue the spreading of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We certainly appreciate your pastor and his wonderful wife, Reverend Tom and Judy Ward. May the Lord continue to bless you all until we meet again, Reverend Jackie and Martha Strickland. A bundle of thanks to you all for your thoughtfulness. Today our text will be in the book of Job, chapter 23. Job chapter 23, and while... While you're turning there, it'll be on the screen in just a minute. Uh, I think about Job a lot. Do y'all ever think about Job? I think about all that he went through, and I think about uh, how in the world uh, did he measure up as he did. But you know, the testimony of God concerning Job was that he was the most righteous man on earth. He was the, he was the most righteous person on earth. And then I... That, for that reason, I asked myself the question, well, why in the world? I mean, just for the sake of Satan, I uh, want to try to prove a point. Uh, why would the Lord let him be uh, go through what he went through? And uh, I know that, uh, the things that he lost for his, his family, for example, we can't get over that. If you ever lost a family member, you're still having trouble getting over it. He lost his whole family there, all of his children in one shot. Uh, and his sons and daughters and his wealth. He, he was a very wealthy man. Think about that. He lost every cent he had one day. Health. We always run into the doctors and planning another appointment somewhere. Uh, he lost his health. Uh, big boils formed on his body, and he took a gourd, uh, a dry gourd, and scraped the blisters so that the blisters would break and the mess would run down his body. He's kind of in a bad way, don't you reckon? Uh, but I, I don't know that we can ever imagine uh, the extent and the severity of what he was going through, but yet he managed to go through it, and he was a trooper. I want to take some of the wordings that we find there this morning God has given us, and I want to share with you in just a few minutes that we're together. Maybe it'll help all of us as we think about these words, beginning in verse 10 of chapter 3. The Bible says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept, and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Our text today is going to be, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. God, would you lead us this morning? There's no way in the world that in my own strength I have the ability to say what needs to be said right now. But God, if you would just give me the grace for a few minutes, give me the wall of grace, Lord, that comes through prayer, that we'll be able to share this word with somebody that you intended to get it this morning, that they'll... I know how to handle the struggles they're going through. 
They'll know how to deal with the challenges that life has been so cruel to bring upon them. God, help us all, for there's not one here today that wouldn't fall under such pressure. Lead us and guide us. Let us be calm by the very fact to know that you find us in your sight precious. The Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord, even is the death of his saints. God, thank you. Lead us now and make our thoughts pure in your thoughts. And Lord, let our lips be afraid to utter aught but what thou hast given. And Lord, we'll give you the glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Job had been accosted already by his wife. When all this stuff, the clamor began to happen, and I learned something from that many years ago. We lived on James Island, uh, South Carolina, down on the other side of Charleston. And we, when we were living there, and we went, we went to church over there. And on Wednesday evening, they had church all over the church. I'm telling you, we had meals, and uh, we ate, and then we had lessons and provided. But in one of those lessons, it was about Job. And it was about the question that was asked during one of those lessons was, how does a man die? And, uh, you know, we often think about that was, here the th thoughts we have, well, some have heart attack. Others have cancer. Others uh, get killed on the road. Others die in war. There are many different ways that men die. But the question that, that came to the fore was, and the answer that came to the fore, and it came out of the book of Job, curse God and die. Curse God and die. I, ne I had never heard that before at uh, that time. We, went, we were at Fort Johnson Baptist Church, and, and the pastor was teaching, and, and, and that's, that was, uh, he brought that forth out of the book of Job. Curse God and die. So Job's wife had already tried to uh, entreat him, Job, look here, you're in a mess. Why don't you just curse God and die? So that must, must have been the way that people had lived for it to be on her mind. Just curse God and die. Here's what more often than not, Job and his friends, his friends have already, there's three of them, I don't think they were his friends. Uh, they, were, they were just some people that said they might have been, but they, they were, had already tormented him. Surely there's a sin that you committed, and you need to come on up front and confess it. Surely you've done something that is, is so wrong in your life that all this stuff, God has allowed all this stuff to come upon you. Surely there's something going on in your life, Job. And here he is, and he, he don't even want to hear it, number one. He's wanting to, to be as short with them as he can so they'll go on down the road and, and not hear it anymore. Uh, so that weren't really what he needed for that time. But he's been through that. He went through his wife. He, he has gone through his own internal pain that he's having, trying to figure out in his heart and in his soul, uh, why is this happening to me? Because he himself said, well, you see it right here. He says, but the, he knoweth the way that I take uh, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So my way has been a, the right way. And, and that's exactly what Paul writing to Corinth said, uh, your way will be tried and it will come forth as gold. It's gold and silver, it'll burn as hay and stubble. So that's exactly, in the teachings of the Scripture, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be gold and silver when we're in the right way of walking with the way of the Lord, and it won't perish when the fire tests it. And so uh, that, his answer was, he, in his own heart and his own spirit, he was, he was dealing with all of that. And this, this stuff has gone on for some time. Have y'all ever been through anything that, that caused you to wonder how much longer it's going to last? And, and what have you done and why has this all of a sudden all this stuff's happened to me? But that's, that's the way life is. I've noticed that, that calamity runs in families. I've noticed that all, at some point in time you'll see families. They, calamity will start with one, then before you know it, something else piles on. And, and before it's all said and done, it's swept through the whole family. Oh, always, most of the time, leaving families devastated. But always, at the end of, of the journey, leaving families blessed because through all that they've gone through, they have realized 
that the only hope we have is God. Job knew that. Job knew that, and, and, and so because he knew that, he's going to go through all this stuff, everything that happened, he's going to make it through, and he, he's not going to curse God. He's not going, he's not going to talk down to God because he knows who God is. God is exalted. And he's not going to talk down. And, and by the way, while we pass by that little thing there that I just said, I, I want you to know that when, when we sing that song, when he reached way down for me, I want you all to know God is a high God and God is lifted up. And God had to stoop down and he had to bring himself down to where we were in order to, that he might lift us up to a better place. Y'all need to remember that, that, that God put effort into getting you out of where you were. He had to stoop where you were to get you out. And that, that's what the Bible said, that Jesus became sin for us. That's what that's all about. Now, there was a witness just flew all over this church uh, from that statement. But he had, to get, he had to stoop down there and, and to get us out from where we were, break, bring us to where we are today, he had to reach down here and come down where we were. And so, therefore, the coming of the Lord to Calvary, the coming of the Lord so that men could see God in the flesh and know how God lived, and they saw it in Jesus Christ. And when they saw it, the church didn't like it. That's amazing to me. I still can't get over that. The church still didn't like it when they saw God in the flesh, and so they tried to kill Christ. You see, God interferes with sinful men. The ways of God interfere with the ways of sinful men. The mind of God, uh, the Bible said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ, interferes with the way we think. And we don't like it. And we don't like God. And we don't like to live holy. And we don't live righteously. We'd rather live a lie than to live in truth. When knowing all the time that there's a great big camera with a multi Size screen running all the time, and your life is, is a, a picture flowing across it in front of God. And every lie you've tried to hide, and every ill deed that you've done is run right by the eyes of God, and God has seen it all. But yet we think it's hidden. It's not hidden, folks, and that's what he meant when he said the housetop is the place where your sins will be shouted from. Amen. But anyway, that's not our lesson, but hey, that was good. We'll work our way there, and after a while, we'll be to the place uh, where we need to go. But we, I'll try to find a place. I wanted to read it all, but you can't read it all. We only have so many minutes. And, but I, I wanted to read it all so that, that we could understand, because out of his calamity, Job is talking to one of his friends right now, but out of his calamity, he realizes to some degree, but on the other hand, he don't realize. Uh, why the, but he says, my foot have held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. And, and if the friend that's trying to get him to confess something, uh, he's not going to do it. He says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. And folks, this is where we're going to dwell the rest of our time uh, in this service this morning. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now listen to me. I want to tell you all something. Whether or not that you know the Scriptures, whether or not that you believe the Scriptures, uh, I'm just telling you right now, uh, man in man's condition, uh, in a world that at now in our nation, now our nation is saying there is no God. If there is, we don't believe in Him. Our, our leadership in and Washington is saying, let's do away with this religion thing, especially Christianity. It always interferes. It's hateful speech because you know men love being queers, and you know women love being lesbians, and you know gamblers love to gamble, whoremongers love to whoremong, and you know people just love to sin. Let's do away with God, and it won't matter no more. That's what some of you are doing right here this morning. You're sinning like the devil, and you're trying to do away with it under some guise and some name. Job said, I have not stepped away from the commandment which God has given. I have not stepped away from God in any way. And when it's all tried and all said and all done, it will come out like gold. 
My footprints will be found in unison with the footprints of the Word of God. I will have walked there, and because of that, I will be blessed, and I will prosper. And because of that, all this stuff I'm going through will pass away, and God, who is faithful, will not allow me to be tempted above what I'm able, and God will keep me through all of this. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, that's exactly where it is, and, and that's exactly what we need. Uh, he says, but the, I have esteemed the Word of God as the necessary food that goes into my mouth. We want to talk about that. I'm looking around here. In fact, uh, I forgot what the uh, number is for obesity in America, but most people are obese. The majority of people in America are obese. That means we are excessively overweight. That means that we have uh, gotten outside of the norm. We, we've eaten, don't get mad now. Uh, we, we've eaten more than we should have eaten. We've taken in more calories than we've put out exercise to burn them. And therefore, we, we have a problem. And, and the problem is, is sickness. But the thing I want you to see, uh, people love to eat. I mean, you can talk, you can get people talking about good food and it's like their corners of their mouth, uh, they'll kind of slobber a little bit. It's they, you can see that they're drooling because they know what you're talking about. Amen? I mean, that's just the way it is. We, we don't eat on schedule anymore. We eat out of schedule. See, we didn't, we didn't, have, the, we didn't have the quick, quick suppliers of hamburgers and stuff when we were coming up. Uh, so uh, we ate three meals a day. If you got anything in between, uh, it was the leftovers from whatever meal you were in between. But that was it. That's what you had. That, that was the leftover part of your life. And, and then you went outside and worked it off. That, that's the deal. And, but we had that. And, but uh, people love to eat. You know, I've, I don't remember a time when I didn't love to eat. I don't love it as much as I used to. It don't taste as good to me for some reason. Uh, but it don't seem to you know, uh, cut down. Uh, but uh, Job said, I esteem the word of God higher than my appetite, higher than anything that goes. He says, I'll tell you, he, the words of his mouth, I esteem them more than the, my necessary food. The food for life is what he's talking about. Even in the Old Testament, they picked up on the importance of the Word of God. For Joshua, God said, don't turn to the left or right away from my Word. Uh, to David and to all the kings and leadership, to the judges, judge according to my Word. Uh, to, to people that would live godly and not be condemned and put to death, don't turn away from my Word. I mean, the Word of God has always been the standard. And this morning as I left the house and was, was coming this way, I, I heard was listening to this preacher, and I, it's not important what his name was, but he was using a version of the Bible that was very, I mean, I didn't even recognize it. it I, if I hadn't known the story, I wouldn't have recognized it as the Bible. And you take a kid that's growing up that don't read the Bible and don't know anything about it, he'd say, oh, that preacher used the Bible. No, this mess they're using today ain't no Bible. A lot of it. I mean, and if you grow up with that thing in Sunday school and, and you grow up with it in Bible school and you grow up with it at the Halloween festival and you grow up with it at, at the Yam Parade and you grow up with it and that's all you hear, after a while you're going to think that's the Word of God. But it's not the Word of God. And that's how Satan has got us off the statues and, and, and got us from doting on and dwelling on what God said. You don't hear people talking about it and saying, now wait a minute. Before we get the choir together and sing this song, what does God think about it? Hold on a minute. We, we're going to do this carnival. What does God think about this carnival? Hold on a minute. I'm going, you're going to go over yonder and work. What does God feel about going over yonder and working? I'm going to marry this woman. What did God say about that woman? I'm going to marry this man. What did God say about that? And on and on and on it goes. And we don't stop to to. Ask God how he feels about it. But we don't have to. All we got to do is read the book. And the book tells us how God feels. He's already said how he feels. And he's not going to change his mind just because you've come along and want him to. 
or I've come along and want him to. Uh, because we need something to hide behind to continue doing what we know is wrong. You won't never find that place in the Word of God. So Job, facing what he was facing, esteemed the Word of God. And later on, if you know anything about the book of Job, God's going to come to him and, is, and he's going to tell him what he thinks. He's going to tell him uh, all that's going on, and at the end of it all, the satisfaction of Job uh, will be confirmed in his relationship with the Lord uh, and what he's gone through, and his life, the latter end, will be better than the beginning because all that, that, that sin and Satan has taken away will be replaced by a gracious and powerful God. And the truth that he has received, he will walk in it. Guys, if you can ever walk in the truth, if you can ever walk, if you can ever live by the word of God, all of us, if we can ever live by the word of God, we'll be at the place where we need to be. But it will restrain your behavior. It will restrain what you can do and what you can't do. So if you're thinking about wanting to walk with the Lord, you need to think about there will be restraints placed on your life from that day forward. Restraints of worldliness. Restraints of, of, of what other people are doing that everybody seems to want to do what other people do. Those You'll have restraints. For if any man shall live godly, he will suffer persecution. If you follow me, they hated me, Jesus said, and they will hate you. Y'all know what the hatred of man is? I'm telling you right now, uh, it. The most hated man in America today is Donald J. Trump. They hate him with a passion and don't even know why they hate him. Because somebody said that they hated him. Somebody said that he is a racist. Where's the proof? Well, Charlottesville. I mean, it's, it's just on and on and on. They hate him. It used to be somebody else, but now it's Donald J. Trump. And if you will get righteous in your community, it'll be Thomas L. Ward and Susie B. Jackson and whoever you may be for a different reason. But people will hate you if you will live according to what the Lord has said. But you see, hungering after having an appetite for, your greatest appetite is for the Word of God, then the only thing that can result as that will be a life lived like Job. That's it. Your receiving will be what Job received. You know, it rained last night and the wind blew. I noticed my pumpkins had blown down in my yard there, and it, we had driven them, Judy and I had driven them down in the ground, so it must have been a pretty strange wind. But it blowed at your house too. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. If I, if I hunger for, like the Bible says, like the deer by the water, like panning for water by the river or by the water brook, that's how it is with, with my desire. That's when you had rather have the Word of God than the necessary food for you to eat, it rains on you too. When it hails, it hails at your house, beats your crop up. When, the, when death passes by, hit, people die at your house. You lose your children, your children are rebellious like the people at another house. So all this stuff happens. Living godly is not going to put an umbrella over you and, and when, when hail falls and keep the hail from hitting you. But I'll tell you what it will do. The umbrella will help you survive. Amen. It'll help you survive the hail. It'll help you survive the storm. It'll help you to overcome and not be so discouraged that you curse God and die. Now, why have we left the art of God's word? I can remember, uh, you know, we did, everybody didn't graduate when I was coming along. Uh, and the generation before me, uh, you seemed like that 
some people, when they talk to you, well, I, I'll be honest with you, uh, my greatest years, uh, all three of them were in the fourth grade. That's as high as I went. And they would tell you that and laugh. But they were, they were people who, whose dependence was on God. They, uh, life was very simple. They didn't have a, a mansion to pin uh, all the adornments and mansions on and to have something to brag about or to have a name with the elite in the community. They didn't drive the biggest cars. They most of the time had one that they had to push a lot. And, uh, and so, but, you know, they, they're depend they were unlearned as far as the world is concerned, but yet they were wise. They learned the things that you could go in the woods and dig up and, it would help you with arthritis and gout and, and fevers and stuff like that. They learned a lot of things to be so ignorant. And, but, and what they did know more than anything else is they depended on the spiritual leaders to teach them the laws of God. And once they had been taught the laws of God, their striving was to live according to that law. Today, we have a decrease in baptisms. We have a decrease in church attendance. We are losing 1,500 pastors a year. We, we just, I mean, it's, it's, everything is the opposite of what it used to be. Pastors used to would gear up and come and go to three churches on Sunday and pastor, they pastored two or three churches. They didn't complain about the package. Uh, they would go home with sweet potatoes or go home with chickens in a cage or go home with, with, with things that would help them, and they kept coming back, and the revivals kept happening at their churches, and lives kept being changed. But uh, today, we can't have revival to save our life. Today, we, we can't hardly get anything done that is spiritual in sense. We can't get, we can't move. You know why? Because we've left. Our hungering is not for the Word of God. We are not, that is not the one food we feel like we've got to have above every food. It's not the Word of God. Because the Word of God is like a pair of pliers on your finger. If you mash it, it'll pinch you. And that's what, that's what the Scripture meant when it says it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I was putting something in, the, in a drawer, and I, and I leaned up against the drawer before I got my hand out, and he caught one of my fingers, and I said, oh, Lord, I'd already beat that one off, so I reckon I'm going to have another black finger over there. Uh, and, and I, I mean, a freak thing, but it hurt so bad. We're not going to do the things that hurt us so bad. We, we, we had rather shopped and tied. I mean, you, you just run and eat. We, we'll pay $100 a meal and give God 2 or $3. I mean, that's just the way it is. We, we, we want more and more and more. I was thinking, uh, you know, the United Auto Workers are looking at signing a deal with, the, with General Motors. I, I tell you, trucks are already up around seventy dollars and $80,000. And, and look here, there ain't nobody in this building that can afford a $100,000 truck. You may have a big head and think you can, but you have no warranty you ever pay for it. So don't, don't come in here with your chest stuck out to me. I know you. You ain't got that kind of money. You're just fluffing your feathers to make people think you're somebody. But if you're driving a $100,000 truck, you're stupid. That's all I can tell you. But it's going to be 110 is what I wanted to tell you. Because how much is it going to take? How much an hour will people be satisfied? There ain't a man in this building worth $100 an hour. You hear me? Or a woman. I don't care if you got 11 doctor's degree and you know everything about everything in this world. $100 an hour is too much money for you. You're not worth it. But yet we have driven everything. To a ridiculous race. Old people can't buy bread at the store because we have insisted on a pay raise. And in the end of it all, we're going to have to feed grandma. We're going to have to feed grandpa. We're going to have to feed the poor because we've driven everybody out of the marketplace and they can't afford the product no more. That's it. 
$3 that I made a day is worth $100 that I make a day now when I made the $3. $3 took me a long way. I, passing I cropped tobacco for $3 a day, 14, 15 year old boy. I, at the end of the year, I bought me a brand new bicycle. Man, that thing, it rode good. I'm telling you right now, I didn't have no lowering kit to put in it or loud mufflers worth Blake. Or loud mufflers that jack it up and let it down, you know what I'm saying? And and didn't pull off in a little color and say, there goes bait. <laughs> but but y'all know what I'm talking about, right? But I'd, I'd buy my bicycle and I don't know what it cost. And I'd buy my blue jeans and shirts for the next school year. I had all that kind of money laid up in store from three dollars a day. Three dollars a day. I'd work from sun up to sundown for three dollars a day. Let me tell y'all, folks, today, $3, you couldn't, well, you can't even buy a box of snuff y'all like to eat. It's $5. <laughs> Amen? I mean, just think about all that stuff. Uh, used to, you, you could, I'd take my girlfriend out, and, shh, Judy, you didn't know this, but, uh, but I, I'd take her out, I'd have $5, I'd go there to the Watts Brothers out at Williams School, I'd put gas in the tank, Gas was like 10, 12, 14 cents a gallon. So you'd fill your car up, go on up there and see a drive-in Moody, and then get you something to eat and still have money after $5. Folks, where are you going? Where am I going with this message? People are never satisfied. That's where I'm going. You see, you were better off with my $3 than you are today with your $100. You know, I, I, I appreciate men who are successful. I appreciate billionaires. They just didn't get to be billionaires by sitting at the house. They, they had an innovative mind, and they, had, they were the first one to develop a transistor or something like that, and they marketed it, and more power to them. The guy that is the author of Facebook, look, how many of you sat around on Facebook? He, he knew something was coming of it. And, and it's made him a, he, one of the richest people in the world. Uh, but, uh, and there's nothing wrong with innovation. But what I'm trying to tell you is, if that's your God, if that's the thing you hunger and thirst after, if you, go, you won't give up until you become a millionaire, well, I'm telling you, I can tell you right now, you've left God out somewhere. And that's the great tragedy. That's the great tragedy. I want everybody to have nice things, but look here, the nicest place you're going to ever go is coming if you're a Christian. The nicest place you'll ever live is coming heaven how beautiful heaven must be I, them, them people sitting up there in that, that satellite this morning if they got a radio could hear our voice from here but they they can see sights that you and i would never dream of seeing they can the majesty of what they're looking out as they look out the space window doors the majesty of, of where they are we just can't the majesty of god and, and we forsake him for this little, this little garden we live in down here that we think is great and really it's our death. It's our death. It's, it's distracted us away from life and it's caused our mind to meddle more in death than anything else. And at the end of it all, that's where we're going to end up. Because we left. The commandments, the statutes of the Lord. Guys, I, I can make you as mad. I make my young ones mad when I tell them where they're at. But I don't care how mad you get. If the way you're living and the way you're doing is not found in God's word, you're living in sin. Can I repeat that and get an Amen. If, you, if your life and how you're living and the way you're doing can't be found in the Scripture, you're living in sin. And you're going to go to hell if you don't get the sin out of your life. That's just as humble a presentation of hell as I can give you. But that's what's going to happen to you. And, and that's uh, people today are leaving. Everybody is a Monday morning quarterback. Uh, I don't agree with the preacher on what he said this morning. Well, have a good day. I don't agree with you in the way you're living either. 
But have a great day. But you better get in that word and find out if the preacher told you the truth. It's what you better do. And if you found out that I didn't tell you the truth, you come on back, me and you will talk. And we'll see. But the whole thing about it is the appetite for God's word has waned. And the reason, that's why we're having so much chaos in living. Men that live godly, they got a made-up mind, number one. They got a made-up mind about where they're headed. Uh, life today is an advertisement. Uh, we get, we, I, was, I was at Sam's the other day, and, and you walk through the television thing, and it, every TV there is getting bigger and bigger. And now, uh, for your convenience, uh, you need to tell Buck about this, they got them with curved screens on them, so no matter where you sit in the room, it'll, it'll, you can see the whole screen. So you can be sitting over in the corner, and if it's an 80-inch television, you can see the whole, because it's curved. And, you, you know, people like William and the money these loggers make can afford it. You notice I kind of went to the logger side when I said that. But, but the truth of it is, that's what it is. But it, it, everything is appeasing the eye of men. L look at dresses. Y'all ever go and put on dresses? I'm going to tell y'all something. Do y'all know what a dress is supposed to look like on a woman? Now, they got any accommodation you want out there to accommodate your flesh 100%. You can let this hang out and you can let this hang down. They can see this and they can see this. If that's what you want, go ahead and pop it out there and let the world see it. But do y'all think that's a godly thing? Do you think if I can see any part of your breast, it's godly? Do you think if I can see your rear end, it's godly? Do you think these jeans that are so straight and you can't got enough holes in them? Y'all think that's godly? Somebody justified the godliness of, of that stuff. Say, he's preaching on clothes. No, I'm not, guys. I'm just telling you. If your appetite is for the word of God, you'll find it there. Because y'all know what the sins are left in the world? Put your coat on, preacher. Right here is one of the sins. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. So if you're trying to get somebody to look at you, you dress up what they're going to see with their eyes. And... That's, that's the appeal of, of the guy down there that, that's effeminate, that's designing dresses or pants, clothes for men. The designer is going to make it appealing to the lust of the flesh and the eyes. And he's going to put a price on it that'll knock your eyes out, and you're going to go buy it. Because, you see, he's got... Alexa sitting in your home and Alexa's monitoring your buying habits and what you talk about in your home and, and they're passing that on and they're designing things that you talk about and want. And they call that the devil. And you know the devil ain't going to design nothing for God. Amen. And so... When we talk about all that's related, dress is a part of it. Our, our mental attitude is a part of it. Everything we are is a part of it. You see, what, what we do in education is we, we want to get your, to your brain. And, and the educators, if their determination is to teach you communism, they'll, put it in, they'll get it into your brain. They'll change your mind about it, and, and therefore, look at the, look at the wave of, of blowing across America where we're, we're going to go, where they're going to do away with a lot of stuff that, that we used to hold in high esteem in, in America because we have this Generation Z or Generation X or whatever it is. Uh, they, those people have been brought up and trained up in our educational system with their minds have been changed. It's all right to have a socialistic system where everything is free. And so free college, free medicine, 
free dental, free everything. And you know yourself, even a high school student sitting here knows everything is not free. But they, but you're, they tell you that long enough, and you're going to find out. But when you find out, the cow's already running down the road. The gate's already flung open. How are you going to bring it back once you've got everything started free? Well, we're going we're gonna to get all these billionaires and take what they got. That's what they want to do anyway. That's socialism. We're going to take what other people have. Well, that's going on now. They call it welfare. Taking what people that work have and giving it to people that won't work. That's what I call it. And so there's where we are. And I know that's plain talk. I'm not talking to hurt nobody's feelings, guys. I'm just, I just want you all to see I'm talking about the Word of God and, and how it should be our greatest appetite. And if we'll get in the Word of God, every bit of the things I've talked about this very morning will find the right root in your life, and you'll become the person of God that you'll desire to follow Him. And that's the whole purpose, and that's what we want to do. You, you'll still make mistakes. You'll stump up. You, you will trip up. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We can get up and go on. We don't have to live in the ditch because the Word of God says we, can, we don't have to. We can get up out of the pig troughs and come home because the Father won't throw us out. He'll welcome us home. And so we, we have all of that in the Word of God. We have a financial plan in the Word of God that will make us wealthy men. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and, and all this other stuff will happen to you. If you just listen to the Word of God, if you just walk in it, find your footprints in it, if you just trust God, He'll deliver you when you've lost everything. Amen? He'll deliver you when you've lost everything. When your children are, are laying in the graveyard, when your grandchildren are dead and when your family has been destroyed, when, you, when you, everything you own, the IRS took, when everything you have, a storm destroyed it, God will deliver you and your latter end will be better than when you began. Amen. That's the whole thing. And see, so, here's what we want to kind of remind you about. The Bible said... It would have been better for you not to hear this message this morning and hear this message this morning and go away and do nothing with it. There's a sad, there's a sad part of it. You young people that are newlyweds and got new families, I know you're up to here, you're busy. You're busy. But you're going to make it. <laughs> you're going to make it. Your little butt's just going to have to put your nose to the plow and, and just let something else suffer. Don't let church and, and your work for the Lord suffer. You're just going to have to grind your nose on the grindstone of life. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You, you're going to get there if you'll just be like Job. When, when I'm tried, it'll come back as gold and my relationship to my relationship to God. That, that's, that's what really matters. I mean, I understand everybody has priorities you have to do in life, but God is the first priority. His word is the first priority. And, and don't throw it aside so you can do what you think is necessary. Look here, I know. Can I, I told uh, Brother Anthony Friday night, I'd rather be home tonight if you want to, me to confess. I'd rather be home. I felt yucky all day long. We had Baptist men. And I, I was very honest, but he didn't ask me and I didn't tell him. But that's the way I felt. I would have stayed home. But here's why I told him I didn't stay home. What would you have thought of me if I'd have stayed home? You wouldn't have known why I stayed home. And you would have probably had a feeling about me not attending Baptist men's meeting because I'm the preacher. Paul said, I can be all things to all men that I might win some. You, you see that? You go to church sometimes when you feel yucky. I mean, you, you go to church when you're tired. When you've been through hell all day by that supervisor that don't like you uh, because you still go to church. You still get a hold of the meat hook of Jesus and hold on to it. And you hold on to the word of God because it says he will carry you through. God loves you. He don't hate you. He, he hates the sin in our life. And when we read the Bible, we'll find that out. That it's the sin he hates, not us. He hates sins. 
And God so loved that he sent his only begotten son. So Job, we all know, we, we, got the, we got the Bible here and we read it through and through. And we all know that he makes it. We all know. And, and God doesn't answer his, in, his he, he queries God about some things and God answers me. But God always tells him, I can do what I want to. And that's one thing that you've got to understand. What God does is not to worry you, but God loves you. And he don't have to come in to no pulpit, to no pew, to no deacon board and ask him if it's all right if he does something. He can do what he pleases to do, what pleases him. Therefore, Brother William, we need to ask him what pleases him, and that's what we need to be doing. Right there, that's it. You young people up there in that balcony got that? Now, I'm going to tell you this stuff's important. God's word is the most important thing. And I, in times past, not so much anymore. I used to think, I, here's what I'd say, I'm about to starve to death. How many of y'all heard that in your house? Donna's looking at books, she's heard it. But, but you know, you, you, you do, you've said that. I said it. I used to eat, I, I can remember Tony and Shane and, and, and they'd sit down and they'd eat, folks, they didn't just have a bowl of cereal, they ate a box of cereal. We, I mean, we went to the grocery store to the seminary, or not seminary, but the whatever that thing's, commissary. We went to the commissary. We'd have a buggy over here full of gallons of milk. And another one over here full of boxes of cereal. They each one loved a different kind. And I've always thought they ought to be twice as big as they are as much as they eat. But that ain't the way it works, is it? They got this little old short war genetic. And so, <laughs> shut up up there. <laughs> but they had the appetite. And, and I can remember Tony had the biggest jaw muscles, and he still does. When he bites, you can see the biggest jaw muscles. He had an appetite. But the Bible says our appetite ought to be for, as that we have there, it ought to be greater for the Word of God. What I need in life to sustain me my appetite for what God says ought to be greater than that. When I feel like I'm starving to death, yeah, folks, when you are not around uh, God and not with God's people and you're not in fellowship in somewhere, you ought to feel like you are, here's what you ought to say, mine, I'm starving to death. To be with the people of God. You see how that works? That's what he's talking about. But he made it through, sister. Did you hear me? He made it through. He got to the other side. And just for closing, Stephanie's going to get ready and we're going to have a song, Michelle. There's one other thing I want to show you. But I, I, I do pray that you've listened above everything today. How important the Word of God is. I'm tired of arguing with people about the right and wrong of their life. You can tell them a thousand times and they still got the same answer. They won't change the way they believe. But the word of God is so plain with them. <laughs> 42, 12. Listen. So the Lord bless the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and a 100 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of his first Genema, the name of his second Kezia, the name of the third Karen Hapuk, and in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. See, that was an uncommon thing. Women did not get an inheritance because they were women. Job's daughters were beautiful and got an inheritance. 
After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations, and Job died being old and full of days. If you'd have saw him sitting there, it'd have looked like he was in his last day. I mean, he had ashes on his head. He had raw sores oozing. You ever seen anything ooze? I have. And, and it, it just oozed. Well, if you'd have saw him, you wouldn't have given him 10 minutes. But how many years did he live after all that? 140 years. What has God got in store for y'all? Tony and uh, Buck and William would tell me sometimes, uh, said that Tony has, it just talks about me dying. Because nobody in my family lived as long on the men's side until generations the recent generations, my grand my grandfather and my and his brothers and all them seventy, seventy one. So Tony in his expectation, fallen genetically, said, Well daddy's right in that zone. So when we were going through that zone, he fretted about it. But the truth was he was right. None of them lived. But let me tell you something else. None of them before my generation had God called to be preacher. Amen? And so, and just think in my line, they're looking, he's called two out of my line there. Y'all, think about that stuff. You see, you got to think about the blessings of God. Men say, uh, I mean, Buck comes from a family uh, who has heart disease, blood problems. And so the wisdom would be find out what their records were and be sure you check yourself because the possibilities are genetically you could have a genetic tie. But I'm going to tell you something. I read the Bible and I think a, a genetic tie spiritually to God stretches out your years. I believe it. So I've asked him the other day for 15 years longer preaching. That's just preaching. By that time, I'll have to be helping Judy in and out and she won't be able to go. Uh, so I'll have to stay home with her. But I'll watch it on Facebook as Brother Tony comes on over here and preaches over here. I'll watch it at Facebook and send you a note every once in a while and talk to Roger on his Facebook. Amen. Now, y'all laughing, but I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm serious. I saw a picture of him the other day. He was slim, tall, handsome-looking old rascal. Amen. I tell you, that, no wonder he married such a pretty woman. He put the move on. I know what he did, old silver tongue. But y'all think about all that stuff. It's because of what Job right here. Think about Job. And then here's what I want you to think about <clears throat> beyond that. You ready? What Job knew about God. Jeffrey changed his life. What Job knew about God changed his life. And it's like that little old song that I sing, curse the Lord and die, she said, Job, curse the Lord and die, he said, no, I'll not turn my back on him now. My vows were made for good or bad, he's been to bread. Y'all don't worry about that baby over there. Come on, that's a young one. Let her cry. She's got something going on. There ain't nothing wrong with her. Just let her get it out. See? It's all right, baby. Just go right ahead. But what you know about God's going to help you. It's going to save you. It's going to deliver you. And if you go home and go over to Sherry's thing she's doing right there right now and copy this message, you'd be a wise person. Not because I preached it good, but because of its content. If you get this message and listen to the words of it, you'd be a wise person. 
Because it comes right out of the Bible here. That, that how Job lived his life and his ex. He was he 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 really could have been down in the mouth, Jesse. He really could have been down in the mouth uh, when he says when he's saying all this because he'd been through so much. He really could have been down in the mouth. But what was he saying? When I'm tried, it'll come out as gold. When my steps are checked on, my steps will have followed him and been ordered by God. See, guys, that's the point I wanted you to get this morning. Not that you're so mean and in such a bad place. I just want you to follow God. Just let his word lead you and guide you because men will get your temper messed up and you'll cuss and fight and beat and bang. Please don't listen to men. You'll be in a hole you can't get out of more, most of the time. And so just, just ignore that and just read what the Bible says. The Bible said God so loved the world. He loved everybody. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to me. Let's quit fighting about that that don't matter. And let's start loving the one who does matter. And doing what he tells us to do. What's our song? Softly and tenderly, Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling. Calling for us today. If you're not a Christian, I'm going to invite you to come to, and Accept Christ, ask him to be the Savior of your life. The Bible said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's that following that word, you know. You don't have to jump no fences between where you're sitting and getting here. You don't have to do anything other than what the Lord tells you to do. Call on him, ask him, invite him, and he'll save you today. Softly and tenderly, he's calling you. Call in, O sinner come home. Let him have his way. Would you stand to your feet? Would you come as you feel led to come? Maybe there's a burden on your heart that needs to be lifted. Come and ask him to lift the burden. Maybe there's a commitment in your heart that needs to be made. Make the commitment.
Because most often than not, they're just out there striking. They, they really want to learn, but they're just striking. We need to teach them. Teach them how. Don't tell them that they're wrong to feel the way they feel, but tell them how to manage what they're feeling. How not to do what they're doing. How not to get tangled up in sexual sin and, and drugs. And how not to get tangled up with the wrong people and wrong relationships. Teach them. Don't judge them. Teach them how to live in a society like we're living in with all the pressures pointing there. But teach them. Teach them from the Word of God. Amen. And in our church, it's the King James Version. Now, how they teach it down the road, that's their business. But in our church, it's the King James. And so we, we just invite you, if you will help pray for that, and maybe God will use you. I don't know who he's going to use, but I'm just telling you we have that need. And, folks, we hadn't forgot. If, if you worked last year, you worked this year. Some of you have told me you want to do other things. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and start doing what you, you wanted to help, you wanted to assist. Go and, and be the assistant. Go and do what it is that you wanted to do. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I love y'all. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you. We saw some faces today that we haven't seen in a while. And I'm so glad I did. Lord, I just pray that for the lost man or woman here, boy or girl, maybe something's been said that will has helped and will encourage some. Lord, just want to say for the person struggling with issues in life, Lord, that you would help them to deal with the issues. I pray for those that are having to put up with foolishness around them. I pray for our church that our church would be like a nitrogen, there'd be nitrogen, on, spiritual nitrogen at, put to the roots of our life that we would begin to grow again. Not just numerically, but we'd begin to grow spiritually. We'd find friendship with each other and, and encouragement and build one another up in the Lord that we'd help those that are struggling and those that weep and sob over the issues they're having to face and we'd help them make it through again. Lord, please lead us and guide us that we don't make stupid mistakes. Lord, but that we would grow people for the kingdom service. Thank you for the witness by Chassie and Song, what a great message. Thank you for the folks running the sound and the, and the video upstairs. Thank you, Lord, for those that are going to come and clean that water up over there after a while. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you do and for the way you do it. For every life that you touched this morning, thank you for those that were listening on our message on Facebook. Thank you for those that when this rolls over to YouTube, that it'll be sent all over the place to help people decide the word of the Lord is what I hunger for. That's my first appetite. And then do it to the glory of God. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Love y'all.